Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I'd be grateful if you could uh, keep your Bibles open at uh, Proverbs chapter 1, um, but uh, we will flick uh, once or twice, so uh, be ready with uh, nimble fingers. Well, before we begin, let's uh, pray for God's help. Father, we thank you that you are um, present with your people and we pray now that as we come to your words that you might be at work by your spirit to, to bring this word of yours to bear on our lives, that you might speak uh, to us in the present with these ancient scriptures. We pray that you might use them to shape us, to make us more and more the people that you would have us be, that you would make us wise. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to be wise? Uh, what is a wise person like? Maybe you think of somebody who uh, knows a lot of stuff, you know, one of those people who always seems to win at trivial pursuit over Christmas, uh, as annoying as that may be. Uh, maybe you think of somebody who uh, gives really good advice, that person who just always knows the right thing when you come to them for a bit of insight. After I left school, I, uh, I spent a year working for a, a large insurance and investment company, and um, I still have a mug on my shelf at home that advertised their website, and the slogan on it was WW Wisdom. You can work that out if that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, they claimed that they had good wisdom on offer when it came to your investments and your insurance needs. Um, ironically, they made some fairly poor decisions and they ultimately had to be eaten up by another large company, which kind of makes that uh, mug ring slightly hollow now. Well, this evening we start this small, uh, this uh, short series in Proverbs, and the big thing in Proverbs is wisdom. And Proverbs isn't here simply to show us what wisdom is, it's not a book for spectators, it wants to involve us. I don't know if you ever had that experience where maybe you're reading a book and you get kind of halfway through a chapter, and I think particularly with factual books, I find, and uh, you're, re you're halfway through a chapter and you suddenly realize that you've got absolutely no idea why the paragraph you've just read is actually there, what on earth it has to do with the rest of the book, why on earth it's, it's going to be relevant for the rest of the book, and why has the writer written it? What's the point? I don't know, that happens to me quite a lot. I like books to be perfectly clear about what they're about and why what's in it is there. And that's really what these opening verses of Proverbs do for us. There are no-nonsense introduction to the book so that you know exactly what you should expect from it. Verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then you just get a, a series of purpose statements for attaining wisdom and discipline, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, for giving prudence. Now, the idea is that uh, here is this book of Proverbs, and this is why they are here. This is what they're meant to do for you. This is what you're meant to get from them. And the key thing, three times in these verses and over and over again through the rest of the book, is wisdom. But what is wisdom? Well, the basic sense of wisdom is, is to do with skill or expertise, but to leave it at that really doesn't do, doesn't do it justice. Uh, in the context of Proverbs, wisdom is really the answer to the question, how do you skillfully navigate your way through life under God? And with that in mind, wisdom is a term that runs really deep. It's about taking experience and keen observation and teaching and knowledge of God and storing those things and sort of fermenting them deep in your heart and then using the resulting cocktail to guide us to the right path, to guide us to holy living, to help and enable us to make good and godly choices. And not simply about the big things or churchy things, but in all of life, including, especially, the, riddle, the little nitty-gritty bits. Wisdom is for your, your family life and your work life. It's for your relationships, for your families and your friendships and your feuds. 
It's for marriage and sex and parenting. It's for what you say and when you say it, whether you're a foot-in-mouth sort of person or whether you hardly ever speak up. It's for your money and your time. It's for those who are busy and up before the crack of dawn and for those who can hardly bring themselves to roll out of bed before midday. It's for your fears and your hopes. It's for your future. Wisdom is rich and varied. And actually, the rest of the terms that we come across in these verses then really begin to sort of fill out and outline what wisdom entails, what it is. In verse 2, you get discipline, or uh, other translations have instruction. The idea of that word is to be uh, corrected or to be set straight, sort of humbly heeding the voice of parents or teachers or experience or things you've observed and then being shaped by them. It's an integral part of wisdom. There's no wisdom without discipline. In the second half of verse 2, you get understanding words of insight. Uh, That's really uh, being able to recognize and take in and grasp and apply uh, insightful teaching and observations. It's about being able to sort of uh, rightly interpret things, about being able to rightly judge and discern between things. And then in verse 3, he says, wisdom involves acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, or other Bibles uh, translate it, receive instruction in wise dealing. Uh, The idea is taking on instruction and correction, uh, leading to sort of good sense in daily life. But in the second half of verse 3, it becomes clear that wisdom and everything that involves it, it is not simply about sort of finding your way to life at its most enjoyable or life at its easiest or life at its most successful. It's not just there to sort of make your life a little bit better, a little bit more simple, a little bit more well managed. It's not a secular thing. In fact, it's actually deeply and profoundly moral. In the second half of verse 3, the writer explains what this disciplined and prudent life looks like. And he says, it is doing what is right and just and fair. Wisdom is about life under God. It's about holiness. Uh, One preacher has said that it is about biblical success. Wisdom is not lifestyle. It is a matter of right and wrong. It's, about, it's not about choosing what option is right for you in any range of situations. It is about learning to follow the good and the right way in life that God has set out for his people. Now, there are more terms in the following verses. We'll come to them in a moment. But wisdom is, is really skillfully navigating through life under God's. And with that in mind then, the wise person sees that wisdom is good. Now that might seem like a rather obvious thing to say, but it is crucially important. Uh, The first nine chapters of this book of Proverbs uh, are really an extended call and an extended warning to persuade us to choose this way of wisdom. In fact, it actually gets really personal in chapters 8 and 9 because the writer sort of draws these two pictures of wisdom and folly of, uh, and they, he portrays them as two women. And these two women are just calling out to you uh, to, to come and join them in their house. And our passage plays its part in this persuasion. Uh, maybe you noticed as you read through that the writer just kind of As he unpacks what wisdom is, he just kind of piles up phrase on phrase on phrase on phrase. It's discipline, it's understanding words of insight, it's acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, it's doing what is right and just and fair, it's getting prudence, it's knowledge, it's discretion, it's adding to your learning, it's getting guidance, it's understanding proverbs and parables and sayings and riddles. It's as if the writer is sort of throwing open one of those massive two-door fridges and kind of hurling doors open and going, look how much stuff is in there and look how good it is. Or maybe like at a museum, uh, you know, uh, a museum, you've got those kind of, you've got the cabinets all around the walls and you can go and look at the stuff. 
But also they have those cabinets which sort of sit right in the middle of the floor and they're, they're glass and they're on all sides. And maybe there's a particularly kind of impressive precious stone or some tablet or some piece of pottery. And uh, it's in that case so that you can walk all the way around it and you can look at it from all sorts of different angles to make sure you get it in its kind of full glory. Verses 2 to 6 are the glass cabinet in the middle of the museum room, showing off wisdom from every angle, inviting you to see how good and how impressive it really is. Which is maybe something we need to tune into Some of you may remember those adverts for Apple computers from a few years ago with the comedians Mitchell and Webb. The Apple computer was uh, represented by Robert Webb. He was the trendy guy and he was relaxed and had good hair. And then you had the Microsoft PC who was represented by David Mitchell and he was a dork in a beige blazer and a tedious tie and a side parting. I'm sorry if that's you. And I wonder if... (laughs) If sometimes we, we, the latter, the, the, the David Mitchell character, is sort of how we think of those words like discipline, prudence, discernment, discretion. Sensible, but ultimately stifling and boring and predictable. Certainly not for the lively and the creative And maybe we'd rather our lives were characterized by words like spontaneity and experimentation and journey and choice and experience. Now, ultimately, I think that that way of thinking really kind of creates a a false choice for us. Wisdom and all that it involves are, are not only for the dull and the dour, for people with no sense of adventure, nor does it mean those things. In fact, actually, as you work your way through the book, you find that that really wisdom is the path to true fulfillment. It is the path to a life well and abundantly lived. But also that way of thinking tends to undervalue where wisdom leads and what it offers, and it misses the disaster that folly will lead to. If you just pick your way through chapters 1 to 3, you find that wisdom offers God's favor and protection. Wisdom will keep you from moral disaster. Wisdom will lead to enduring life and God's ongoing goodness. Whereas folly will lead to a miserable end. It will lead to calamity. It will lead to ultimate death it will lead to being cut off from God. Now, Proverbs, is a, sometimes it's characterized as a bit of a black and white book. You do, you do something wise and you'll have a good life. You do something stupid and foolish, you'll have a bad life. And it, sometimes it is black and white in those terms, but it is, it's sophisticated. The writers knew that life actually doesn't work in quite such black and white terms. The book recognizes that there are plenty of cases where the wicked and foolish have success and the wise suffer. Now, in some cases, the observations are simply generally borne out by reality. If, if you stay sober and you keep your head and you work hard, you are more likely to be a successful person than if you're drunk and you've got a bad temper and you, uh, you're really lazy. But there are proverbs that do recognize that this doesn't always happen. And so others of them point us to the long view. They point us to the fact that God will ultimately work out these things. Which is why then the fear of the Lord and trust in him are so crucial. Why would you need to trust God actually if life always worked in those black and white terms? But God will certainly work those things out. The wise person values and pursues wisdom, wisdom, and more wisdom. Because wisdom is truly good. And it will ultimately be shown to be good. As we move on, another characteristic of the wise person is readiness to learn. And this is true in two ways. Firstly, in the sense that everybody has something to learn. 
which is really what's spelled out in verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, he says that wisdom is for the simple and the young. Uh, Now, to be simple here doesn't simply mean to, doesn't mean really not very bright. Uh, That's probably the way we use it now, but it it's more about being so, uh, so open to everything and everyone that really you could be led in all sorts of directions, whether it's good or bad. It's to do with being easily influenced, maybe even naive, although again, not quite in the sense that we use the term naive, but in, in the sense that uh, it's to do with a, a lack of ability to appreciate which is the right path in relation to God, the sort of person who's really willing to try anything. And what they need, he says, is prudence or shrewdness. They need to learn to be smart. Openness to every idea and every experience uh, might be seen increasingly as a virtue in our society, but it's not biblical wisdom. We need to be able to discern between things and see them for what they truly are. To be young uh, certainly includes age, but it probably also includes uh, experience as well. And this book offers knowledge, uh, that is, uh, an understanding of how things work in God's world, and of right and wrong before God in all sorts of situations. And it offers discretion, the ability to see the best course of action. Which is pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, The simple and the young surely could do with a bit of wisdom. But it's also for the wise and the discerning. The wise can still add to their learning, he says. The discerning still need and can get guidance to keep on taking the right and godly course in life. Wisdom, his point is, is for everyone. However successful we feel, However well you are doing in life, however happy your family relationships are, however well brought up your children have proved to be, however well your career is going, however happy your marriage is, however closely you are walking with God, however far you have grown in godliness, wisdom is for you and you still have something to learn. And for those of us who know that we really could do with a little more shrewdness, a little more knowledge, a little more discretion. There is help here for us. This is one of those situations where you really can never, ever get too much of a good thing. Wisdom requires a, a really a good sense of humility in us. It requires us to realize and admit that at whatever stage of life we are, we have not made it. And there is never a point at which we can say, I can handle this. We can never pray for wisdom too often. We need to keep growing and growing and growing in it. And this growth comes by wrestling. You see, wisdom requires us to wrestle. In verse 6, the, uh, the writer outlines the sort of teaching that you're going to find in this book. There are proverbs, there are parables, there are sayings, there are riddles. Uh, Artfully put, nuggets of truth. Teasing, ambiguous, sarcastic sometimes, sayings. Cryptic, playful statements and questions. And some of them can be really puzzling. Uh, Do a bit of flicking. If you flick forwards to chapter 26... And when you found it, just have a quick look at verse 4 and then have a look at verse 5. Chapter 26, verses 4 and verse 5. Verse 4 says this, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Verse 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Which do you do? I mean, what on earth do you make of that statement? Proverbs can look like the the material for a nice, quick, quiet time, five minutes to a wiser day, but they're deceptive in their length. Back when I was a kid, I remember being delighted to discover that there was such a thing as an everlasting gobstopper. 
uh, being a relative veteran when it came to sweets, I have to say I was slightly sceptical. I'd crunched my way through a fair number of boiled sweets by then. But when I finally got hold of one, I really wasn't disappointed. It was a, a little bit bigger than, than a golf ball, I guess. And um, you could just about sort of cram it into your mouth. And uh, you had to sit there for hour and hour and hour after sucking it. And uh, mouth slightly open because you couldn't actually close your mouth around it. And you were sort of dribbling as you sucked it. It was fairly disgusting. And slowly, 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 it would just get a little bit smaller. And actually, it came in its own little case, which was a good thing, because you really needed it. Uh, because, you know, to, to actually finish this thing took days of concerted sucking. This was a project. Uh, Proverbs are the, the everlasting gobstoppers of the Bible. Uh, they are not the Maltesers that melt in a moment. We're not meant to plow through them like you do with, say, uh, bits of narrative and, you know, the stories in Genesis or the Gospels. Uh, they're meant to be worked on. They're meant to be sucked on with a bit of dribble coming down your face. They're meant to take time, which takes real patience and perseverance. And my wife loves doing uh, puzzles like Sudoku, and uh, occasionally I maybe watch her on the sofa and look over her shoulder and think, oh, I'll have a go at that. My attempts invariably last a matter of minutes. Uh, they drive me. They drive me crazy. I hate puzzles. <laughs> it took five minutes to frustration and throwing the pencil down. But we cannot do that with proverbs. They are designed to be chewed on, and the wise person comes ready to do that. The writer in Proverbs wrote odd statements like chapter twenty-six, verses four and five, not because he was stupid. Well, not because there was some editor who was just so stupid that he put those two things right next to each other. It was written like that on purpose. It was meant to make you look at it and go, that is weird. What on earth does that mean? And then for you to suck and chew and try and figure out what's going on. Which means that we need to be ready to stick at the task of gaining wisdom. Ready to push through frustration and impatience. We need to be ready to persevere. If we want to be wise, we need to come with a humble attitude and right expectations. The wise person is ready to learn. Well, the final characteristic of the wise person is fear of the Lord. He says the wise person fears the Lord. This is last, not because it's least important, but actually because it's the most important. As we come away from this passage, it's meant to be the, the most recent thought in your head. If you forget everything else that I've said, or more importantly, the previous six verses, you need to remember this one. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. When I was young, I took very seriously the fact that the adder is the uh, only poisonous snake native to the UK. And, uh, one day I happened to be out walking with my parents, and I was quite small, so I was running on ahead. And uh, as I was running, I suddenly looked down and I stopped dead. Because there in front of me, right in the middle of the path, was an adder. And I took one good look at that black zigzag along its back. And with a horrified cry, I'd like to say shout, but I was small, so it was a cry. I turned tail and I ran, well, let's face it, for my very life. Now, fear of the Lord is not that. It's not about horrified, abject terror. It's to do with, uh, with reverence, with humility, with uh, submission. It's about realizing who really is God around here. It's about realizing who the world really belongs to. It's about realizing who really calls the shots in the world, in my life, and to act accordingly. You see, wisdom is not about having loads and loads of information. In fact, it's not actually really about intelligence. So you can have spades of those things and still be a fool. It is about our attitude to God. It, it's, a, it's a relational concept. And not just to sort of any God, any sort of higher being. You notice that it's fear of the Lord in capital letters. That's the 
our English Bible's way of, uh, of expressing the word Yahweh, the, the name that God specially revealed to his people, the name that signaled his commitment to his people. It is about our attitude to the God of the Bible. It is about being submissive to him, about wanting to be uh, obedient to him, about being ready to know him better. Which is great, not least because this means that wisdom is actually attainable for all of us. It is not only for those who are blessed with, a, with innate common sense. It is not only for those who are bright and quick thinking. It is for all those who fear the Lord. And fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom because this is where real wisdom starts and because it is where real wisdom finds its foundation. When you learn a language, you can't just kind of learn a bunch of words and uh, try and string them together and you learn how to pronounce them. You, it doesn't mean you can then kind of speak the language. You, you need to learn some grammar as well. You need to understand what order the words should go in and what types of verb you should use in a, any different situation. And You need to learn different tenses and uh, whether things should be male or female or neuter in the appropriate languages. There's all sorts of grammar you need to kind of get before you can really understand the language and communicate in it. And fear of the Lord is the grammar for this book. Fear of the Lord is the grammar for Proverbs. In fact, it is the grammar for wisdom generally. In one sense, this book could actually be twice as long because we need to hear verse 7 after every other verse that we read. We can only, only truly understand and live the rest of this book if we have got verse 7. This book is not a manual for success in business or a happier family or a more satisfying marriage or lasting friendships. If we read its sayings like that, then we have missed the point and wisdom will pass us by. It does help us with those things, absolutely. But at its heart, it is instruction in a life well lived under God. Wisdom is not secular. It has everything to do with God. And until we learn to fear him, we will miss out on true, real wisdom. And for us at this stage in, in God's work in the world, in the outworking of his great purposes across the Bible, we find these things ultimately in Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is God's supreme revelation of himself. We submit to God, we fear him as we trust in Jesus and follow Jesus. And as we do, we find that actually wisdom is right there. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that Jesus embodies and expresses God's wisdom. In his letter to uh, the Colossians in chapter 2, he says that Jesus Christ is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The wise person fears the Lord, submits to God, follows Christ, because there is no other way to get wise, no other way to live well and skillfully in God's world, no other way to follow the right path. Proverbs wants us to get wise to skillfully walk in God's way in all of life. The wise person sees that wisdom is good. The wise person is ready to learn and to wrestle. And the wise person lives by the maxim, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Who are you going to be? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we thank you that your your word is not um, distant from us. It's not uh, 
It's not hidden from the realities of our lives and separate, but that you dig right into the the depths of the lives we live and experience and you speak to us about how we should know you and follow you and be your people. We pray, Father, that as we go through these next couple of weeks that you might teach us a little of what it means to be wise, that you might shape us, that we might live skillfully under you. Amen.